OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Just welcome everybody. It's great to be um, at the TDLS again this year. And um, boy, I had a, I just felt so inspired this morning to hear um, from our keynote speaker and hope you did as well. And because of that, I've actually changed a few things on my slide deck um, um, because I, I was so inspired. So here we go. So my name is Jamie Nash. I'm the director at Tamil Pius Adult School. I'm in Marin County. We're a small adult school serving just about under 500, 550 a year, three program areas, um, a small healthcare pathway CTE, a GED high school diploma, and an ESL program. Um, do the SMEs also want to share who they are in the room? I think Elise is there. Subject matter experts, go ahead and introduce yourselves. So I'm Elisa Takeuchi. Um, I'm an ESL and CTE teacher for Garden Grove Adult Education. And I'm Susan Gare, and I'm a subject matter expert, retired professor, and uh, that will things. <laughs> yep, that's important to be an adult ed, right? For no matter what your role is. Um, so thank you. Um, so we're gonna come back to this part participant share question in just a minute. So I'm gonna um, move forward for just a sec and just talk about um, just the plan for today, which is each slide deck has a, has a guided question in hopes of just having some participation and sort of interactive discussion amongst our participants today. Um, It'd be great if we wanted to talk about some of these items here that I have listed, but really the session is open ended so I've prepared slides for each of these areas, but if we ever land on something and spend more time on it that's wonderful, or if we just go through them that works as well. So um, i'm going to go back here and just ask um, anyone in the room or online um, or both to talk about an, an, an innovative technology related best practice. Um, that you've used that's been a win for your school, your staff or your students. There's no right or wrong here. It can be big, it can be small. I'm happy to lead off, but I, I don't want to hog the space. Is there anybody that wants to share? Just what's worked for them? I Go, can ahead. Share. Go ahead, Josh. Uh, well, this is a big one uh, for the uh, District of Adult and Career Education down in LUSD when the pandemic hit. Um, everybody, of course, was thrown online, and I think the majority of our staff really had not much experience teaching online or using technology in the classroom. So the district collected a bunch of teacher experts, and they um, actually created some what they called master courses, which were just basically um, an LMS, Schoology is what we use. They were shells that any teacher could use um, in their classroom and then they could sort of tweak the shell, which the shell was fully formed. It had all the lessons and everything in there, but then the teacher could tweak it to meet their needs. And um, it was a it was a very, very long learning curve, but ultimately it was very successful. And is there a particular class in particular that just really was highlighted or that teachers kept asking for or first of all, I love it, by the way, this is so awesome to hear. So we, we created shells for each of the ESL levels. There was a shell created for the um, high set program and there was a couple of shells created for the uh, ABE program. Mm -hmm. We're still working on CTE classes. Okay. Yep. That is wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Who else? Who else would like to share an innovative practice that either came out of COVID or came post COVID? I don't know. Are we post COVID yet? I guess <laughs> recently people think we are, but you know, any any innovative best practice that you want to share out. I, I love that, Josh. And that is big. Thank you for sharing that. Hey, we have Omar from Corona Norco here. All right. All right. Um, so something that happened a little bit of a afterthought when COVID was ending, let's say, and we were back, not everybody was back, the people are still not back. And so, yes, we have uh, Canvas, we have some different things that we use, but for me, I went back to the classroom, I went back to having a class teaching, and 
with EO Civics being online and having some like the tests and the objectives online. And because not all of my students were coming daily because they have the option of having access to the curriculum online. So we did a little bit of a hybrid model or I gave them some options to do additional hours outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. I realized that uh, with Google Slides being available and kind of keeping myself organized, I was able to create a Google slide, uh, a Google page that had Google Slides that have uh, the lessons. So essentially with the website, I was able to create like a unit or a semester, have it available. We kept putting things up there, uh, new pages, new information, uh, videos uh, we were able to share. So it has developed for the last six months. I, I have something that I'm sharing in my session tomorrow, just because it keeps everything together. The, uh, and so I'm excited to be able to create units based on EO Civics, have everything in one entity, and just mm, having the students just go to that place. Yeah. And that's where they do everything. They can watch the videos, they can comment, and it's a website just for that separate. So it, I'm looking at like creating a virtual file that is always there with all my links. And, and so I think that was the missing piece. I know how to use uh, YouTube. I know how to use Kahoot. I know how to use all these things, but I didn't have something outside Canvas that I can own and manipulate. And so now having the Google site creates that opportunity and I can break it in chunks that makes sense for me. And the students will have access for forever, essentially, or, you know, and it could be updated live or daily. And so I'm excited because I've done websites before, but having something that is so intuitive, so easy and, and free, it, it's it, it's exciting for educators. I, and, and having it in my phone and putting it on my drive and I can just push it out. Uh, I'm teaching my session tomorrow all with, with my phone on. So that's mm -hmm. gonna be great because it's all there. And so I like things that they can, they can do that and they don't need a download. They don't need many other things or purchase anything, which is great for, at least for my students. Omar, that sounds absolutely fantastic. And I think really what you're talking about is that you've expanded access to your class in so many ways to the students that are participating in your class. And that's kind of what I'm hoping, that this is exactly what I was hoping that we could talk about today um, was, was, was doing that very thing. Um, and you've done that and that's just amazing. And um, a question for you is, um, what have you noticed with your students? Uh, are they well, able? Yeah, go ahead. I'll leave it open ended. The great piece, of, the great takeaway is, if if done correctly, <clears> and, and, and I've been an administrator, I've been an educator. So when you have all of those hats, uh, you're thinking from different angles. So as an administrator, I love that we're we can capture hours and reach additional or uh, meet goals or meet you know all those things beyond the confines of the classroom and the time with the teacher. So that's amazing. We just have to do a little bit you know, of how to keep track of those hours and, and how long will the activities will take place. So you can give it a, like a number value. As a teacher, again, great, because all of a sudden still, still stay connected without necessarily being there because I can just record the session as I'm doing the class. Uh, even if it's just the slideshow with my voice, um, and they can I, I can upload it and they can watch it later. Um, again, they I don't have to send them just the PowerPoint. They can actually see the class, the class, see the interaction with the students, uh, and be. And it's kind of archived, so it's great because then even when I do it myself later, so it has so many layers as an educator. And, and you know, and and as an administrator, because you can get yeah 
all these things. That Thank you, fun. Omar. Thank you so much. Yes, this is amazing and it's wonderful. And I, I bet your students are just very appreciative. Um, and just the fact that you're expanding your access to students in this way is just wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Does anybody else want to share? Um, I know I saw um, it, it's her pictures, Regina, but she says she's Arlene online and Arlene is using Google Classroom. I don't know if you would like to share out on that. I think she's unmuted, but I don't hear anything. And I will just say, um, well, hopefully we'll get that fixed, but um, it's great. Good, good job using Google Classroom. Anybody else feel like sharing in the room or online? Well, Tammy, I just want to say we're doing this right here. That's incredible. We're having a hybrid conference. Wouldn't have done that three years ago, would we? Yeah, you are so right, Susan. That's exactly right. Yes. Um, I will do a quick share out um, of something that we've been using this year, um, and I, I'll talk about it a little, a little bit later, but we've been using we were really um, intentionally focused on the high flex model, so allowing students to be in class, but also to be at home um, to uh, access education or their class. Um, and we've been doing it for a variety of different reasons. One of one of them being, you know, the weather's been rough around here. I think probably where you guys are too. And so the bus system is horrible here. And if it's completely raining and deluging, no one's going to get on the bus and and do the walking that it requires because the bus. Again, the system isn't great. So we've been allowing, some of our teachers have been allowing students to zoom in when the weather's um, just chaotic or if they're sick, because we still have people that are, ha you know, that have COVID and that's been a game changer for our students. Um, and I will say one of the newer things that we're looking at um, is the high flex model um, for subs. We have a humongous, horrible teacher shortage. Um, here in Marin County, and I imagine it's like that everywhere else. And so I have teachers that um, live in different areas, not necessarily the Marin, and they might teach an online class um, only, but they're able to sub um, remotely. So I can have our students join in the classroom, but the teachers, the sub for that class in particular is, is remote. And that's been a game changer for us. So instead of changing or canceling a class, I've been able to have a sub remote. So that's something new that I hadn't thought of that would be um, a success and it students seem to be okay with it. It hasn't been horrible. So has anyone else tried that? Has that been something anyone else has used? Okay, no. So I'm gonna move on. Any other last year? So I'm gonna move us on. Okay, I will just give one small one. Um, Elisa is in the room and she was our first ever during COVID, our first ever ESL uh, lowest level remote only teacher. We never had offered a class in at that level um, remotely and it was just a, a wonderful opportunity um, for our students, especially during COVID, because we all know that that group was so disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, at least that was our experience. Um, and so it was wonderful to have an online only class for that group of students. And that was all last year. And that was the wonderful Elisa Teguji sitting in the in the room there. So thank you for that. All right, I'm gonna move on if it lets me keep going here. Okay. Um, so one of the things that, um, that I heard really, um, that I was reminded about this morning with our keynote speaker is that crisis breeds inequity. And I wondered if anybody else connected with that statement that, that was heard this morning. Did anybody else kind of think about that? Yes, I know that um, there was definitely trauma. Uh, I know that there was a lot of things that we still need to address. I feel that we we deal with things, we open up the schools, we move forward, but we haven't had the tough conversations to understand that it will never be the same, that we are forever changed. And um, I think we have to create environments that are um, different. Um, I know us, again, you know, as an administrator, we wanna see the classroom school, we wanna see the teacher in the classroom, but that's limiting, 
right? And so how do we understand that we can offer a class online when the teacher is also online, when they might not be physically in our presence, but they maintain a high level of uh, uh, you know, education, uh, the academics are on point, the students are still attending. And, and it is not super attractive, I can say as an administrator, because we do we want to have the control, but as an educator, now back going back to the classroom, if uh, you were able to offer, let's say, you know, in a perfect world, OTAN had some courses available for students, like they have for teachers, but, uh, you know, a virtual situation, I can, Omar Andrade, uh, contract with OTAN to teach a class online for from my house or from Corona on my specific area of expertise. And it could be an eight week course or it could be a 12 week and maybe figure out a way where there's not double dipping, but the funding is shared. I don't know how the funding will work. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why it's such a hard conversation to have because we all want to get credit for things mm -hmm. um, financially. But um, I think it's time for us to to have that conversation because it's needed. Some people, you just said it, the weather has been atrocious mm -hmm. for attendance. I am supervising the Corona High School classes. Uh, I'm there with six other teachers and sometimes they couldn't make it just because mm -hmm. they couldn't get there. So I had to break up classes. I had to uh, you know, go in for a teacher. And all those things are not the best to keep your numbers up or to keep people engaged or coming back because yeah. it just fractures that trust. I don't know. There's Thank you, Omar. So, and I'm going to ask others in the room or online to kind of talk about how, you know, again, uh, the, I really related to the comment that, that, um, that the crisis uh, bread inequity and I saw it almost immediately with the our lowest level English language learners. Um, so many who were public facing right first to lose their jobs. Had no in our area very little governmental support um, for um, housing initially and um, food initially um, and um, access to technology was just you know, all of it horrible. Um, and it, it targeted, it seemed to target our very lowest level uh, English language learners first. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about from the people here today, you know, what, what have you done differently in terms of some of these that you see? We, we, talk, we just on the last uh, couple minutes ago talked about things that have changed in your programs, which is great. What about some of those things like support services? And I appreciate Omar, you saying, you you're talking about the intentionality of having these difficult conversations and hopefully we've actually all been having them frankly since COVID. but um you know what are some of the new support services that you're offering to deal with what you know now that you didn't know then um or how have you in integrated technology um with your staff um especially in you know many of us have staff that really weren't so um didn't love technology and specific programs per perhaps even had more uh, teachers in programs where technology wasn't their first go to. Um, did your site technology plan or your your continuous improvement plan change? Did you apply for grants? Um, did you, is your vision different for your, your school than it was before? Um, and I think this little graphic, no, leave no one behind is so important. We know way more than we knew then. So what are we going to what are we going to do to ensure that our people have access and that we don't have a situation like that again. Anybody want to speak up? So Jamie, um, at Garden Grove, um, during that we had WASP during pa the pandemic and then along with SIP. And so um, it really, we really took a turn from our goals and, and we switched them up and, and with our action plan. And so we are much, much more um, connected with our community, our CBOs, um, our stakeholders. We made major connections with organizations we never had connections with before. 
and vice versa. I mean, they really needed us as well because they're, you know, obviously their businesses went, you know, their clientele went lower as well. So, you know, for us to be able to help each other, um, prepare our students, and then also let them know about the resources and then them coming to us and telling them, us about our resources and how they can help our students. It, it, it's, it's been such a magical relationship. I mean, and that's all the years, 20 years I've been there, it hasn't been like that. So that was, um, you know, kind of a blessing in disguise because, you know, we were hit really hard because we had WASC at the same time, you know, and then the new SIP. And then it was like, you know, so many things at the same time, but yet we really focused our goals. Oh, and we, and then Melissa and I were in DLAC. So we really kept our goals very similar, you know, and we kind of tripled it, you know, and stuff. instead of reinventing a whole bunch of different goals, we just kept it the same goals and um, it really strengthened our program, I think. Oh, that's amazing. I love hearing that. And and did you have a particular partnership that really stands out just for the rest to hear? Like, I mean, because I, I love that you're talking about the the ingrained in the community and really forming different perhaps partnerships than you had in past years or, or making them different. And I'm just wondering if there was anyone that really stood out, any partner, any community organization. Yeah, we have an organization called um, o, uh, Okaipa, and it's a health organization, and they're literally across the street, like the crosswalk to their office, and we didn't know this for a long time, because they didn't communicate with us, we didn't communicate them, and we just happened to find them, and, and it's a really great service for our students, um, you know, finding low, you know, free low health care systems, or insurance, or uh, so many things, uh, food banks, blah, 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 you know, it's, it's almost a one-stop shop. And then also our OC workforce, that was another really big one that was helpful for us, um, for our students. We have a mobile unit that comes to our, our campus now, it's a big bus, and they they help them with uh, finding jobs and making resumes and stuff like that. It's a, it's a mobile unit that comes. And so, yeah, they, uh, Garden Grove was recognized at um, CCAE last year for best practices. And wow. so yeah, it was just one of those really, it totally came out of the woodworks because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is amazing. Um, and because you've kind of talked about some really neat things right there, especially that mobile unit, is there anybody that has a questions for Garden Grove on anything that you just heard? I want to make sure that that we don't just keep moving ahead, that if there's questions that you have for our other uh, participants, our subject matter experts, especially on what we just heard, please do speak up. Okay. And on the chat, but Jamie, uh, Arlene did post that uh, using the Google Classroom to post lessons made a lot, of th a lot of things easier to reach your students in the COVID nineteen. And then she was also able to correct the students' homework and do the work online. And it's become almost paperless, which is good for the world. Yeah. And, but I'm curious if she can uh, post something to follow up how the students like that. I know she can't speak, but I think that she could type in her. Uh, Exactly. <laughs> and I would love to know um, which level that you taught. Is it ESL, ABE, ASE? I'm assuming it's ESL, but maybe I'm wrong. And as she types, Josh has his hand raised. Oh, she teach levels three and four. Sorry. Okay, awesome. Um, that is wonderful. And it kind of goes back to Omar's comment, right? Just one stop clicking, one place to go, where to do, where to post, where to see your um uh your finished work corrected um it's it's great go ahead josh actually i have a follow-up question can you hear me yeah okay yes i have a follow-up question for the room once we're finished answering the previous question but it is related um i want to know from everybody here um apps like google and other apps are great for students for you know learning tech and and collaborative learning if they're not physically together in a classroom my question is um a huge percent of our students in LAUSD don't have access to uh, computers even though we actually have a program where they can borrow one but some people just can't get to those places to borrow one um what some of those apps some of like google for example are very very difficult to use on the phone and i'm just wondering a how people have dealt with um, the the sort of uh, translation of how apps work on phones compared to computers, how you deal with that problem, and then B, if there's any apps that you use that are proven phone friendly apps for doing the same sorts of things that we do with apps on the computer. It's a big question. I apologize, but there it is. 
That's a great question. Who who has comments for Josh on that? So, I mean, it's it's looking at what are iPhone compatible apps that we use to bring about our instruction and also Google suite specific apps that work that oftentimes students have difficulty accessing via their phones. Not necessarily accessing, but actually using because they're not necessarily using. phone phone friendly. Got it. Yeah. Uh, I find that, and I'm not sure because I don't have an Android, but uh, with my iPhone, uh, using the Google Classroom, and I'm sure with any of the Google phones will work wonderful, but the Google Classroom is going to be great because I think most of the time they'll have easy access. Um, it doesn't do everything that Canvas or other things do, but it, it, it is a good place to start. The Google site will connect. So you can essentially have all your instructional pieces and your objectives and all your your placeholder that's going to hold links and videos and, and curriculum in the Google site. And the Google Classroom will be a place where students can dump or 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 share or put their assignments in. So um, I would love to give you access to some of my Google Classrooms so you can take a look at what you can do in there. And then maybe we can share the email at the end. So you can sign up and, and look at my classroom or, or look at some of the things that are available to the actual website. And Omar, you mentioned you're going to be teaching a class. I don't know if you said tomorrow or later this afternoon. Will you, is that, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, I have my, my session tomorrow at, I think it's 8.30. That's when we start. Yeah, it's early in the morning and it's, uh, you'll see it on there. It's technology. I, and let me pull it up because I have it on my phone. That was the whole purpose. When I went to my last conference, I, I thought how great it is to just have it on your phone and bring it up so you don't have to... <laughs> deal with the computer because sometimes the students won't have a computer, but they will have a phone. And so it's under enhanced learning, right? So technology enhanced learning and enhanced video links and all of that. So I'll share that through a QR code and that way people can just go to the slides and they look at the videos and it's all on their on the phone. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm sorry, I think one of the things for me too is that um, you know, having the students be able to access the materials, but then unfortunately, no matter what phone they're on, it's going to be difficult for them to do the work on their phone, no matter what. I mean, you know, the, just the, the idea of making fillable PDFs, like, was a huge thing, because that wasn't a thing before either, you know, because of the pandemic, you know, like, that that became a thing, too. So that makes it a little bit easier. But when you're when students are on a phone, you know, no matter how big their phone is, it's still te the texting part of it is difficult. And and so, yeah, it's it's unfortunate that we can give them all the materials. But I mean, if it's still hard for them to do it online on their phones, the work that needs to be get done, a lot of them won't do it. Yeah, some of the assignments, believe it or not, I know it sounds old school, but I just have them do it on a piece of paper and take a picture and send yeah. it to me. And, and and I'll just yes. grade it in, in circle and yeah. send it back. Um, so I have a lot of pictures of documents <laughs> with their phone cameras. And, and a lot of times it's just reinforcement. I'm not grading five paragraph essays really, but yeah. you know, just a follow up question or something to keep them engaged. Um, and, and also to let them know that you're paying attention and that what they're doing matters, even if it's, you know, if it if it looks a little different, if they're, I love that. That's, I love that you mentioned that. And the process itself, yeah. taking attention, right. uploading it is just, you know, I think taking them a skill. So definitely maybe yeah. what it looked like is, is uh, you have a two week pre-class session where you teach them, uh, you know, how to access Google and how to uh, copy the code and how to get that uh, invite. And, you know, and you work on those little things, send them some tutorials through an email where you welcome them in a message. And then if you kind of front load those things, uh, the core of the class will stay on point, knowing that some people are going to come in because it's open enrollment. So you kind of have to revisit that section on how you do that uh, prepping session 
multiple times during your semester. But uh, I, I don't know. I think it's somewhat doable. I don't have anything else that I would use. Well, and I'm going to um, thank you, Omar, for that. I'm going to just give a couple comments that I just am reading in the chat from Arlene, which says that, um, you know, there are times when the phones aren't working also because they have a million things up and open. Um, and so Arlene, which is awesome, has been providing a little bit of um, guidance on removing some of the apps from their phone and kind of making less clutter. Um, and I think that's pretty great as well. Um, and she said something about social media apps being open. And that reminded me that, you know, when COVID, when we were all remote, that WhatsApp was a life, it was a game changer for a lot of our students. Um, and it was a way for some of our teachers to reach students because they were used to WhatsApp. It didn't feel like some brand new thing they didn't know how to use. Um, so thank you, Arlene, for that. Oh um, and then, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say if Susan Gare wanted to add to that. I mean, she's our apps queen in ESL. Is there anything else you wanted to? Well, I kind of like Google Forms because on the phone it's very clean. Mm -hmm. The interface is clean, and the students just have they have there are so many choices that you can do in Google Forms. They can do ranking. They can do. I mean, you don't have to do multiple choice. You can do all kinds of questioning in Google mm -hmm. Forms, and the students it's easy for them to do this. I use them with your low beginning students yeah. when I was uh, I was a guest speaker in their class, and <laughs> we did Google Forms, and they got a certificate after they completed the form, and seventeen of our twenty whatever students did it. Right. It's amazing. That's awesome. Well, and I'm going to move us on here, but I, I did want to just make um, a reference. I know we don't have site technology plans anymore. But, but I still do at, our, at the adult school. And that's because I, I really do feel like we need to continue to think about what we want for our students. And for me, it just, it feels more organized if I do it in a plan. Um, and I know now we're integrating it into the continuous improvement um, as well uh, plans, but it's something I would encourage everyone to kind of consider, especially if you're an administrator role or a tech role at your site is, you know, really, kind of thinking about what are your students need and how do you know they need these things right that's another we're going to talk about data, I hope, in a, a little bit, but um, just. Holding the idea of, a, of the importance of a, a tech plan at your site, even if you're not required to, to have one. All right, let me move us on here. Um, oh, good. See, we're right on run on target for data discussion. So one of the things that I think is really important, and Omar actually uh, highlighted this, is that, you know, we need to continue to understand where our gaps are. You know, um, what data are we using to determine what areas we need to improve in? And Elisa talked about the WASC process, and we went through that as well. And man, do you have to provide a ton of data um, for that? Most of us just did our um, we owe a, a, a application and heard on that, and so that required a lot of data. Um, if you're involved in your Marin, or your uh, adult education consortium and you're doing your one year and three year plan, that's a lot of data. So how do you use all this information that you collect to improve your programs and to get the students what they need so that they could be in your classes successfully, whether on an iPhone which we know is hard or in person or remote only or a whole combination of those. So I'm just wondering what what kind of data do people use to to get the information they need to 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 make your programs better. Ellie. Yeah, and just to, to um, get rid of any confusion, there are two people here using my name, but I'm really Ellie. So um, I'm really Ellie. We, <laughs> <laughs> so when we came back from COVID, we did do a survey of our students to find out who who um, needed computers and or hotspots. And then on um, surprise, we actually followed through and we gave, I mean, we hundreds of laptops and hotspots. They gave the cheapest ones that were kind of 10 years out of date, but it's better than nothing. So, um, so I think at least for that year, we met student technology needs. 
Um, we're now at the point where there's a new crop of students and we don't have as many laptops to give out. So I think we need to find a way to, to keep it ongoing. Um, another thing we did, and it was because I complained, um, we were so caught by surprise with COVID, as was everybody, um, that not only the students, but the teachers didn't know what to do to go online. So when we all came back, they started to go back to business as usual. And I said, no, there was, you know, we had an excuse the first time, but if there's another pandemic or another disaster, we need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. So we do now offer a digital literacy class um, for those students who aren't ready for prime time. But I think we're not pushing it enough. I don't think we've identified all the students who need it. So it's now more of a, almost a, it probably feels to the students like a punishment. You know, they come into the class, they do not know how to open the computer. They, you know, they're looking to type in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they find one and they're looking around the keyboard for two. I mean, that level of, mm -hmm. so, um, so at that point we have to divert them. You know, you, like we're singling them out. And I don't like that. I think that the um, tech literacy should be something we determine when they register and it should be mandatory. So everybody's starting at the same level and not you know, wait until they're failing three weeks in or until they drop out from frustration. Oh, I love that you just brought that up. That is so important to recognize starting off that one the world has changed and the way that we offer instruction and that's not just not in education but it's kind of everywhere it's how we run meetings and how people can apply for things and it's changed it's really changed it's not going to go back to non-technology oriented it's not and so if we want to make sure our people have what they need they they need that technology skill those skills that you're talking about um, one of the things that I want to highlight um, is this digital literacy guidance. Can I just, I can't quite see in the room, but can everybody just either thumbs up or raise your hand if you've actually taken a moment to look at OTAN's digital, digital literacy guidance document? It's really good if you have not, or if you have. If So not very many people, is that what I'm sensing? I can't see in the room and I don't see any hands. Okay. You did. Okay. Um, I will, I will make sure and if, um, if someone could put the link to the, the guidance in the chat for everybody, that would be great. Um, it's really important to have research to fall on and other schools who are doing things that you might be able to implement in uh, to, to up your technology game. Um, one of the things that I was just thinking about with the last speaker um, or first last person that was sharing was just the importance of a really good orientation, um, the importance of perhaps um, providing a, a technology class out before they even pop into your class. Um, it's something that we've done at TAM Adult that's worked really well um, in our consortium. We partner with the, our county office of ed who, on behalf of all of the uh, members of the consortium, provides um, access to an organization called Tech for Life. And Tech for Life comes in and offers classes in English and Spanish on Saturdays, if we want it, um, on about five different areas, all at the beginning level. Um, and it's free for us at the adult school because it's part of the, 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 the program area that the county office um, supports. And they've been incredible. They've just been incredible. It's been a game changer. So we issue students a, a Chromebook they bring it in, they have a two part class I'm beginning to use Chromebooks, a beginner use of Chromebooks, it's either in English or Spanish, they can decide which class they want to take. Um, they get an email, they understand how to open it, they know how to change the language back and forth. Um, and there's, they look at our website and a couple other things, um, they have uh, handheld materials to go home with in English or Spanish and it's just been a game changer for us. Um, we were doing it before not as well, but we were doing it. Um, and it's just one small example of, of what you can do if you really think about what needs to happen for to get your students access. 
Does anybody else want to talk about what, what they do or what they should do or what they'd like to do? Go ahead, Josh. And sorry, if, if someone in the classroom wants to say something, please, let Elisa, just let me know or Susan. So at, uh, at our school, the um, virtual academy, we do have a step class which is only 12 hours though so but it's it's better than nothing so every new student who wants to take a class at the virtual academy must go through the 12 hour program so that at least they're familiar with their device with our lms and some other technical aspects however we really really could use a more sort of extensive class so i was just going to ask you jamie if it's possible for you to share maybe a course outline or or the website for that class it would really be great to sort of see how a, how an in-depth class sort of differs from what we're doing yep um i'm going to just put my email in the chat and you can email me separately about that um, and i am happy to share secretly their material but also you, you know reaching out to them would probably be best um they're up here in northern cal but they might be willing to share their materials more widely. Um, however, I'll say that 12 hours is pretty awesome. That's a that's a good amount of that's a good intro prep class. I would I would think it is, so, but it does it does cover a lot of other things that aren't necessarily getting them tech ready. There is we do have to test them for um, state purposes, and that eats up a big chunk of the time. So, mm -hmm. so the teachers really have to make up a lot of the gaps. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why I'm asking. And that's just so hard. I mean, teachers have such a hard job as it is in such limited time with their students. And really all it takes is one or two people not to really kind of, you know, to be at a lower level technology wise and it just throws off the rest of the class lesson for for the day. It's really, it's tough. Exactly. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, other people, is there anybody that wants to share what they do at, at their site? Um, how they how they collect the data that they use to improve programs or to create a, for instance, a professional development cal a calendar or schedule for your your teachers. What about you, John? Oh, uh, corrections. What do you, tell us tell us about corrections. So this is Ellie from Corrections. <laughs> so as a as a public school teacher for many years before I went to corrections. We were always behind. Um, I remember taking memory from two computers and putting into one so we could continue to run. And I think it's gonna continue as we go into AI. I don't think data collection has changed all that much, quite frankly. I think you have hardware, software, and then you have the literacy of both the teacher and the user that we have tried to bring forth. We are preparing two classes that are going to be 10 to 12 hours, um, basically in the same way you do the English, which is, or in reading, you first you have to learn to read and then you read to learn. Um, we're going to have a um, learning to compute and then computing to learn courses that we're going to hopefully have put together, but it's, it's going to take us a year. And that came from what you said was in a class of either 18 or 27, two to three students that can't use technology will stop the entire process. And I've run into that in my own classroom. Now that we have one-to-one, -one, which only happened in the last month, I've gone from teaching you know, GED math and GED essay writing back to the basics of computing, dragging and dropping, uh, logging in, um, using the calculator on the uh, computers, et cetera. So we in corrections, um, are no different than anybody else, but really it's it's both anecdotal and then it's you know empirical data that has to become it has to come from the same categories. Right now, everybody is saying, "Oh, this is new. This is new. This is new. This is not new." It used to be PowerPoints. You put together a PowerPoint that was one year's worth of uh, lesson plans. The next year, you change the dates, and then if the class, you know, you would uh, remediate or accelerate depending on um your students this is very similar canvas is just a much nicer version of powerpoint but you used to be able to drop in videos in powerpoint you used to be able to well, you still can and you used to be able to drop in um pictures and and then in excel you used to be able to do a lot of interactive work okay so that's one out of 25 to 30 teachers that would do that 
the COVID changed everything. And, and my son and my daughter-in-law are both educators in the Reading area. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, we in corrections sent everybody home when they had to still teach and figure it all out. My daughter-in-law is a second grade teacher which is herding cats when you're in a classroom. And then she was herding cats when she was teaching them all to use technology. And it was so inspirational and fun to watch. And it gave me a lot of ideas that when we were allowed to go back into the prison setting, we at our site instituted uh, some of what she had to do, which was, again, it was learning to compute way before. I mean, there's, there's so many little steps that get missed and then it changes. So you are, you are right now on a cusp of a huge, at least in a tidal wave of change. Um, I've had 15 conversations here with with educators and administrators who are now working part time from home, part time in a classroom. Students are part time from home, part time in a classroom, um, and that changes your discipline structure. That changes the organic uh, classroom nature and the synergy that you can sometimes get in face to face. I haven't seen that come really to fruition in a Zoom setting. I don't see a lot of, woo at the end, man, we learned something. It was hands-on. Uh, my son happens to be a physical education teacher, and I was talking about standards, and he was having him do push-ups, and he wanted to do 25 for each of five weeks for the semester um, that was Zoom, or for the quarter, excuse me. And then there was one student and I was watching him and he said, look, I guess if you can do all 125 right now, you met the standard. <laughs> uh, so the kid banged out 125 push-ups right there. He got his, uh, he got his standard that he met. Yeah. I think when we look at when we look at our ability to gather information, hardware, software, teachers, students, and I think that we could create rubrics here at OTAN and in these digital symposiums that will guide the future. So that's my two cents worth. And I, I will thank you for that. And I will kind of re, on you because your last point just reminded me again, just to check out this digital literacy guidance. Mm-hmm. Um, not only does it have really good information, but it has different agencies that are doing different things. And I loved that you brought up your daughter and what she was doing and, you know, using some of what the good stuff that she has done and learning how to kind of bring it to your population, which is really different than what a lot of us on um, have experience with. So thank you for sharing that. And the, and the link is up. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, any other quick shares? I'm going to take us to our probably our last one or two slides because we have. A, yeah, I'll tell you real quick. So going back to WASP because it was such a such a thing for us. Um, usually what happens with WASP and I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that this happens in a lot of agencies. You get your WASC visit, and then you, you build up to it. You get your WASC visit, and hopefully you get your six years, and then with a three-year mid-review. And what happens is that in three years, nothing's been said or done or talked about until almost the time where they're going to come back. And then all of a sudden, it's like this big, you know, crapshoot again to try to get them all up to date. So what Guard Grove has done is that we cognitively we meet every other month specifically for WASC and we have a living document. And so all the things that are in our action plan, we go through and we update our action plan every other month with our teachers in the different focus areas so that it's not just this catch up after three years. It's like we're documenting all of our data you know, from the get go, from, from the time the WASC team left until the next time they come. And uh, it's it's been it's been so much better. Like the, the tension on the teachers is far less because it's fresh mm-hmm. in our minds instead of like three years. Like what did we do the last three years and trying to like make up or figure out stuff. And so. it's not on paper, right? It's it's in a it's in that digital uh, folder that you can refer back to and add on. As you said, it's a living document. It's so wow. great. Yeah. I hope that other agencies can like, I mean, I, I, we all have it in our brains to do it, but you know, it's like cleaning out the closet or, you know, whatever it is, you know, you put it off, you put it off, you put it off. But if you really just have a plan to do it, we schedule it every other month. So it's, it's been, that's been really helpful for us. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I'm going to move us on. We have about six more minutes. Um, I feel like we've gotten through maybe six slides of the 15 I had, which is fine. I'm going to skip us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to skip us out. Um, ooh, this is one I really wanted to get to, and this is probably our last one. Um, is Who's using Canvas out there? 
We are. And was that yeah. Omar? Was that you? Heard on our article, yeah. Five okay. or seven. Yeah. Six or seven. Oh, good. I, Can anyone I, talk about what they like about it? Well, our curriculum, uh, it works with Canvas. Uh, it's something that I know they use at the college level. So I'm glad that the students are getting that um, that time to to understand it, to know how assignments show up. The teachers are also getting. Uh, we use it in the in the call in the university level because I, I I used to teach at uh, UCR in the summer, so it's great if it becomes like the educational way to to have things available. I guess. Yes. Thank you. And I'm going to just point to the last little bullet I have, which is one of the best reasons to get started with Canvas is to really make sure your students um, have that familiarity, comfort, confidence. They're going to see it if they when they it, when and if they go to college. Um, they're going to see it often in their employment if they're in the educational world, even if they're not in a teaching position. Um, and then it, it promotes access to your classes and to your um, in course instruction. Is there anyone who is thinking about Canvas but isn't so sure? I think the majority of us use it. We're good. I, I use it at the community college where I teach, but they don't use it here in the adult school because it's yeah. too expensive. But I do push for it whenever I can. Oh, so they need to they need to learn about the Canvas pilot with. I was just gonna say they need to talk to us about our special wow. pilot. <laughs> do you, Do you want to talk about that, Netta? Just give a quick because it is not expensive. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll talk to Sarah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. I, I, I cannot recommend it enough um, across different programs. Um, my, we've been, I, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so what typically is a $20 seat um, with Canvas for a student, it, with um, OTAN, it's about $6 a seat. Well, yeah, talk to yeah. Sarah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I've been pushing it for yeah. years, and um, they like it, but but it is the money that's only right. About. No, I understand that, and yeah. I think that's typically the problem. Yeah. I mean, everybody's feeling towards Canvas as a our instructor as an LMS, but um, we're called the uh, California Distance Learning Cooperative, mm -hmm. and so it's just you know now we're just trying to get a group of California adult educators to kind of join the cooperative, and so that we kind of negotiated these prices. And so I'll talk to Sarah and Ryan and see you know if there's anything else that we can do to support their. Decision. It would help because I think they're using it in the in the seven twelve part of the district, ah. and so many of our adult um, students and children that are using it yes. in seven twelve, and that's why we made the move. And that's I I think you know I think they would be more. A lot of my students are resistant to Google Classroom. Yeah, and I think they'd be more. Um, Happy with Canvas, especially if they didn't have to log in with a student ID, um, and then their children could help them. Right, right, yeah. And their children are likely using Canvas, whether they're in high school. I mean, more than likely when they're in high school, but middle school too. Yeah. So it's it's that access, that familiarity, that comfort, that confidence. It's really important, I think, to expose our students to Canvas. And I'm going to say that my staff um, that are using Canvas, and we're mostly using it in ABE and ASC, and we're going to um, look to move over from Google Classroom into um, Canvas for our uh, home care aid class. It's just easier to navigate and use and move things around and um, play with um, and in terms of moving classes and uh, modules and timing and adding. And it's kind of looked at as a living document um, as well, even if it's a full course that you can just continue to change. How do you remediate in Canvas in, uh, how do you remediate in Canvas on the fly? Yes, yes. How, how do, you, are you asking how or do, or you're saying you do it? No, no, I'm saying how do. You? Oh, it's just easy. You So it depends on, you know, how you're doing it, but the way that I, open my classes is we have, I, I go by module. So modules can be weeks, right? Week one, week two, week three. Um, one, you can move your modules around. You can drag and drop them mm -hmm. and then change the date. 
Um, you can go into a particular module and look at what you have planned and change either the lesson plan, you can uplink or download, um, change the links, upload a video, put a new picture. It's really easy. By it's the really easy. Class. But only by the class. By the class. Yeah. But by so, the individual? No, because the well, the way the, the class that you're creating, the template, your your course template is what all your students will have access to. So as you change your, your master document, the students see what you've changed. It could be, uh, we could be looking at this slide right now as a module. And then if you liked this picture better, it, it, they would see this. So it's not a homogeneous grouping of like level or skilled students. No, it's one, yeah, it's one course. Um, you can also copy the course from year to year or semester to semester or whatever timeline you choose um, and and change it in that way too. So you can have a master and you can change that master and just sort of decide you know what you want to add to it. And within a, within a week, you could probably say, you know this level goes here or this level goes here and put the link right in. We have one more comment in the back here. Go ahead. You make group assignments too. I don't know if you, if your question was geared towards assigning things like if you have a class full of people that are at different ability levels. Correct. You can make assignments and then make them like a group assignment, or you can assign them, I believe, to individual yeah. students. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So if that was something that if, like was the gist more of your question? Yes, that was that was. Uh, I, then you can you can have assignments uh, where you create an access code, and then you give those students that access code for a certain level of assignment yeah. that you want. And yeah, and and so they would all be assigned. Whatever your assignments are, would be assigned to that module. Yeah, but. You would have, I believe, the ability to assign certain assignments to certain students that were organized at that point. So I guess every class in Canvas that I've taken has been at the college level, and therefore I didn't. There was no remediation. You either right. you you needed to learn the skills, but in the lowest levels, especially where I am, in the lowest levels in the yeah. vast array, I was looking for: is it simple? I've never used Canvas in a classroom except for as a student. I've never created one. And so I was curious if you can differentiate by the individual. It sounds like you can. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I, you I, like Google Classroom, I think you're really gonna like Canvas. That that's my my sense.